Hey everybody, welcome back to New Video's channel and today we look into how you might overuse reactivity of you. Yeah, that's possible and you shouldn't. Here we go. The use reactivity system is both quite simple to get started with and also very powerful. You can abstract a lot of things away. But of course, as view developers, we like to sprinkle a little bit of ref and maybe even reactive, computed, watch everywhere in our components. This is not necessary though. In a few examples, I want to show you where you can replace ref, reactive or watchers with other things. All right, to get started, we are in the view SFC playground. As usual, link to all of these are also in the description if you want to check them out. And we start with a very simple setup. We have a button, we have an H1 message that is shown when show message is set to true. And then we have an onClick function here. And this onClick function we want to fill. So here we can say show message dot value equals true. We can set the whole thing and we're good, that works. But we wanna do a bit more. We also wanna make sure that this actually sets back to false after a certain amount of time. So how do you do that? Well, we use set timeout. So we wrap the whole call to say show master value equals to false in a set timeout function. So we just call this here and we say, okay, after, I don't know, five seconds, so 5,000 milliseconds, this should be changed. And if you click that now, after a few seconds, we will see that show message will be toggled back to false. And here we go. But now we have a problem because what if the user clicks the button multiple times? Well, it seems like things work fine, especially when it's gone. But now when I click it up again, it disappears way faster. That's because we don't really clear the timeout. So while for this very simple example, it doesn't matter too much, in your actual application that can cause quite some issues. So let's fix that and clear the timeout. Okay, and to make sure the message is not glitching that often, we want to clear the timeout. So commonly we just say, let's introduce a timeout variable here. We can leave it undefined, that's fine. With TypeScript, we could define it to be undefined or a Node.js timeout. And then we say, okay, let's actually assign the timeout value to that set timeout. And last but not least, if there is a timeout value available here, we want to clear that by calling clear timeout with the timeout value. So far, so good. And we can even say, all right, uh, timeout.value, we can unset it, but that doesn't matter too much because down here, we set it up anyway, so we're fine on that side. And if we now click the show button and also hammer it, smash it a bit more, we'll see, okay, the timeout is being cleared, the message stays up here, it doesn't disappear uh, beforehand, and after a while, it will eventually disappear. And now if we trigger it again, things work as expected, nothing breaks. But there's still something wrong here in that example. I mean, functionality-wise, it works, right? So we could leave the code as is. But there is a bit of reactivity here that's unnecessary. Let's check out which part. Maybe some of you spotted a problem already, and the problem is actually this timeout part. Well, I said before, it works, but it doesn't need to be reactive, because all we do is we set it, and in here, we also clear it. We don't use it in a template, we don't use it as reference somewhere else. So what you can do is we can just say let timeout, and set it to undefined by default. And here we just say, if timeout exists, clear timeout and timeout equals set timeout. And now we actually get the same functionality. So I'll click a bit more. Then we see now after five seconds, this is resolved. So that's all fine. It stays there for longer because every click we triggers the timeout and nothing messy is happening. So everything here related to timeouts, very often it is totally fine to just use a simple plain JavaScript variable that we can override because this doesn't need to be reactive. There's nothing else that needs to be reacting on. There might be some cases where you want to have reactivity on that, then you can resort to using a ref, but by default, you really don't have to. And the same actually applies to our second example where we just have some static data in an array. We set it up here, then we set a default, right, ref to say just the first element. Then we have a little shuffle function. Also, please, for the sake of it, don't do it like this. Don't shuffle the whole array like this because this, this is not really random, right? There are better algorithms. This is just for an example in the video. Don't do it. And nevertheless, when we hit shuffle here, we get some static data, mostly some and data and static sometimes. So you see it's not entirely random, but nevertheless, that works. And also here, there is a bit more reactivity than needed. Because, well, as I said before, this up here is just static data. If this will never change, then just treat it as static data. It's fine. The changeable part still needs to be a ref because we want to change that. But now we can replace the dot value everywhere and we don't have to save it. Which, well, also clears up a bit of memory for you. Um, that doesn't hurt. And the garbage collector can do its thing too. So all good. 
especially with a large chunk of structured static data, it is never a bad idea to not use ref for that and only use refs or reactive for whenever you need to be something actually reactive. And that's static data that doesn't apply here. The next example that comes up is actually a favorite of mine because it not only teaches you how to not use reactivity in a certain way, but also other features of Vue.js and when they are quite helpful. And yes, it's a classic. We have two input fields for the first name and the last name, and we want to show the full name down here. So we have two-way data binding applied, but nothing is written down yet because, well, nothing's happening in the script block. And commonly, especially if you know the watch feature, you could say, okay, you know what? Great, we have a watcher, we can use it, watch first name and last name. So actually watch both at the same time. And whenever something changes here, then we can do the following. We have first and last here. We can also make sure we can treat it as a, as a single array as well. We can say a name array. And then we could say full name dot value equals name array dot join with a space. And every time we change something now, that works as expected. So we have first and last name here. And now if we say, okay, this should be filled, that might be like it has some initial value. We can also run it immediately. So we have an immediate true value here as well. Actually, let me quickly show you what happens without. And we say first name is John and last name is Snow. I know how to do it. You know nothing, John Snow. Right, then here we go. We, the watcher doesn't trigger automatically, so we don't have anything reflected. If we type something now, that works, and we don't want that. So commonly, you want to have the good old immediate true here, so it triggers straight away in the beginning, and here we see this works. Quick example again, false, nothing's in there, true, here we go. And yes, that looks weird, because most of you know what to do instead of using a watcher here. Watchers are great for side effects, and it's great to rely on them if you, I don't know, want to do an API call, work with dates, do some randomness, and so on and so on. But for a simple scenario like combining two values, filtering a list, and so on and so on, watchers are a bit more boilerplate and overkill. That doesn't mean they don't work. Well, actually, they do work, but they are not as performant and as obvious and readable as something else. Computer properties, obviously. So let's refactor the whole thing, because actually we have a big part here already. We have this, which means, okay, we rely on the name array, so first name and last name, and we join them together. This we can do in a computer property by saying, okay, full name is just a computed, and in here we can say, let's return first name plus this plus last name. And of course we need to attach the dot values, otherwise things wouldn't work. We need to also import computed if we don't use auto imports over here and things work automatically without even setting anything regarding immediate or, or anything around that. Also, of course, you can refactor this to a template string just for the sake of this video. That's fine like that. More importantly, this will also be lazily evaluated. So if you don't need it in a template or something else, the function in here is not even executed, which can be very helpful if you have business logic or costly operations to be running. Contrary to watchers though, in computers, you should never do side effects. So don't set, I don't know, first name dot value to something else. Let's say first name dot value plus one or something like that, because well, not only that you can cause some funny loops, computers are never guaranteed to run a certain amount of time. So you also get some effects that you don't really want to. Instead, you should really use watchers for that. And you can also use a watcher on a computer property. That's also fully fine. So don't forget to split out when you use watchers or computers. I would always try to solve it with a computer first without using side effects and without using async, async operations and so on and so on. But if that's enough, go for it. And talking about computer properties, well, I've seen a lot of anti-patterns on that one as well. And one is described here. This is a bit more code, so let me quickly walk you through that. Here are some refs defined for like a price, quantity, discount code and shipping. This is like a very simple order management system in the view single file component playground again. And the big part of code is actually hidden in here. We see from line nine to 47. So in here, in that summary, we have, well, some errors, some price calculations, some discount calculations, shipping, taxing, get the total, and then we return all of that together to then use it, well, step by step for like a V model, or in this case, just rendering the whole thing down here. And when you look at the code, you might think, do we need that all of it in a computer property? 
And well, the answer is no, of course not. Actually, it's even a problem because I just explained you, okay, computer properties are lazily evaluated. So if you don't need a certain value, it's fine. It won't be triggered the whole calculation. But now we actually have kind of the opposite effect. So whenever dependency of this computer property changes, no matter if it's the price, the quantity, the discount code, the shipping, all of this will be recalculated. And now, of course, this is rather easy functionality wise, but sometimes the business logic can be quite expensive. So you definitely don't want to re-execute everything that's calculated here just because a tiny thing changes. So instead, you would split it up into different computers. And I would also advocate to split it up into different functions because Right now, the business logic is quite tightly coupled to the framework. And that doesn't only make it harder to test or to change, it's also not very readable. So having your business logic, like calculating the price, the discount, and so on, so on, separate makes it easily testable. I, I hope you write tests, right? You better should. And of course, it makes it also easier to use because then in your computer property, or in properties in this case, you just have a tiny function call with all the reactivity parts. And that's quite helpful. If we would start refactoring that, and don't worry, the video is not that long, so we uh, skip most of the part, I would probably start taking each of these parts out and say, okay, you know what, let's take the discount out, put it in the own computer, and then even abstract the function out of that, and then continue. And eventually we can also, to make sure things still work, we can also put it back in a big computer, but I would probably just get rid of the whole big computer because it's quite unnecessary. If we take a look where summary is used here, besides the word order summary, well, we just say, okay, if there is an error, well, that can be a separate one, right? Just render all of these. And these are all separate things. They're not necessarily related except the total, which can be computed based on the other things. And that's totally fine. But then only the total will change if one of these parts will change, but not each of the calculations. So step-by-step step is a good idea here. By the way, the same idea also applies when you send an object down to a child component as a prop, and it's called prop stability. So instead of sending one big object, only send the things that are actually relevant for the component, and also you can abstract them. So instead of sending an ID, you might just want to send if it's even or odd for coloring, so the component will not have to reevaluate the prop every time the ID changes, but just if it's even or odd, as an example. So thinking about prop stability and what to pass, same for computers, is actually quite helpful. So the last example here seems like a very plain one, just five lines of code. We can actually fully zoom in because there was nothing to show on the right side, but it's still a quite important one. And what's wrong here is actually not much because we set the value, that's a promise that can resolve or reject, it's fine. But actually, if you use the response here only for data fetching, only override it all the time, then this doesn't have to be a ref. This can be a shallow ref. And a shallow ref is only reactive when you actually replace the value. So for data fetching, if a new result comes in, perfectly fine. Also great use case for state management libraries when you want to get the state out of it. But if you want to know more about it, I made a whole video on that. Link, you know where to find it if you're curious and have never heard of ShellRef before. It can definitely be an improvement for performance, once again, especially for huge amounts of data. But I know how much you love data fetching out there. So that might be a good case. And that's it. That's uh, all I can tell you about not overusing reactivity in Vue.js, so definitely check your code. Make sure if you have any questions or suggestions to write them down in the comments. I will read them all. Hope to see you all in the next video. Happy hacking.